because of me, we started a little late, which I know is completely unheard of, right? So um, we're going to keep going, if that's okay with you. So I'm going to invite the next session up, and I'll give you a couple little things. And first of all, when I heard about Well Docs News, I, I, I was just so excited because I hear about the challenges that you guys have. And to see the, he the headway that they're making and groundbreaking uh, for all of us, it's kind of like setting, you know, s setting, new, uh, setting new standards, setting new everything. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm, I'm really proud of them. I'm so excited. This happened even after I chose Anon as a keynote. And um, it, was, it was like, oh my God, on top of it, you have this announcement. This is such a special day. So um, I'm, I'm really proud just being part of the industry for this. Uh, so with that said, one quick thing. Um, we have an app. Uh, we have an app for the show that literally has every session. You can actually give us, you know, feedback on the sessions, et cetera. So it is uh, available uh, at the iPhone store. What is it called? The App Store. And um, I have an iPhone. I should know that. Um, and uh, we'd love we'd love to have you download it. Misfit Wearables has uh, been producing this application for us for a couple years now, and uh, we we couldn't do it without them. So one other quick thing is we're here to help facilitate for you. Um, and I, I don't want you to be shy to introduce yourself to people. Uh, the, con the concept of this is, is, is introductions, meeting new people. And so I don't want you to be shy. However, if you are, <laughs> we are happy to help. Um, we're happy to do introductions. I have a, a, an amazing team, Rafi, Zim, uh, Linda's here, Joel's here. We have a, an incredible team of people that I'm sure if you, if you feel like you'd like the introduction, we can do it as long as we're not in the middle of one, one other thing. So uh, let, let's get going. So a day in the life of a doctor, patient, and caregiver. First title we developed for this show, period. It is, it is a really... It, it sets the stage for everything because the context of how they live their lives is it's a complicated life, right? Doctors are rushing people in and out of offices. They may or may not be getting data. Patients forget to communicate information. They, they you know, what, and, and digital health is really coming to the rescue. And let's not forget the caregivers. Um, caregivers on many different levels. There's the family caregivers and the personal, uh, the, the professional caregivers. Their, their lives are, are so complicated. So what we're trying to do is set the stage so we know what tools are out there, what tools are missing, who is stepping up and delivering these things, what are their needs, and what are the opportunities out there. So with that said, I'm going to leave it up to seriously, I, I, I kind of look at this as a, um, a, a crackpot group. <laughs> um, and moving on to the introduction of Einer. Um, going back to my uh, f uh, fun fact. She is truly at the center of things. Uh, she is literally moving digital health forward at UCSF, obviously an extremely esteemed institution. And it's in a big way. One of the busiest people I know, which is why when I heard that she was a kayaking addict, I wonder how she ever had time for any addiction outside of her work. Maybe she'll be able to tell us that. I'm going to let her go. Do I start the clock? Hi, thank you so much for inviting me here. Let me just give you a caution. Be sure that you give a fun fact when you're asked to, or they'll make something up about you. It is true, I like kayaking, though. It could have been a lot worse. I was a little nervous when she got to that part. I'm very excited to be here today and also to be a part of this amazing team. And what I'd like to do is get myself oriented on the controls here first. I don't seem to have the system. Here we go. No? Sorry, it looks like we need a reset here. Um, I'm going to start by saying that um, we have a, a variety of people presenting from a variety of perspectives here. And I'd like to um, begin by saying that it, the, the breadth and the depth of the panel is a little bit overwhelming to me, and I was also, so I'm humbled by that, and also um, curious by why Jill invited me to moderate the panel when there's so much experience up here. And then uh, I started thinking about conversations we'd had. So, yeah. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Don't you think it's inevitable when you're talking about digital health technology there will be at some point a technical <laughs> flail? It just happened to me every time. Um, so on the panel, as you can see, we have a wide range of speakers. I'm going to present them individually as their turn comes up. But when I was thinking about why did Jill invite me, I started thinking about conversations we've had. And yes, indeed, I'm a clinician. I tend to use the word clinician instead of doctor, probably because I was a PT first, but I respect all my colleagues who are providers and clinicians. So I, I like to use that phrase, and I'm the director of uh, the Bone Health Program at UCSF. And in that, I have multiple tools that I use. Um, but I also remember speaking to her about being a caregiver, because we shared this experience around our parents. And this was my experience in taking my father from a proud World War II hero and bomb squadron commander through his deterioration in his later days, losing his ability to control his bladder and bowel, his ability to walk, the need for a feeding tube. And ultimately, as each facility was lost, I would chase it with personnel, technology, and process. And then I also remember telling her, probably Remember, don't tell her everything, because she never forgets. But I do remember telling her about my own experience of transitioning through a plane that I had never wanted to, and that was from one side of the white coat to the other. And indeed, I became a frequent flyer at the cancer center. And instead of showing you any horrid pictures, this is the picture when I was handed a camera coming out of post-op. This is my Vicodin haze of the people that were there to meet me. And in that process of coming at healthcare and uh, delivery and all different vantage <coughs> points, I realized I was also an innovator because each of the challenges I faced <coughs> on those different routes, excuse me, uh, led me to try to problem solve. And I think that's true for all of the people on the stage here. They're problem solvers and innovators. And so I'm now a member of Pediatric Device Consortium at UCSF and I direct the digital health track in our accelerator and we also just opened the Center for Digital Health Innovation but along the way in this, I've found that there's some common themes to people who are problem solvers and innovators. No matter which of these disciplines you're coming from, we all tend to see problems that we wanna solve. We wanna make things better, so we seek solutions. And in doing that, we have identified some common needs, particularly in health technology. And one of these is we wanna identify who are the right players that we should associate with or pull in to help us. So there's a searching factor. We want to discriminate who are the leaders, so we want to be able to refine our search, and we want to be able to collaborate with these people. And you can just start imagining in your own minds the technologies you're aware of that would help you check off each of those boxes. We also want to know what tools to use. And some of it, I usually tell people as I'm building things, I look at a combination of process and technology. And then we want to be able to connect the dots. So when we identify all these pieces that may be part of the solution, we want to be able to exchange information between them and between the people we're collaborating with, and we want to integrate them uh, all the way down to the granular level of being able to transfer data. And then I think what's really important and sometimes left out but becoming more a part of the conversation is we should be checking on whether our solution is working or not. From the very minute we step to the whiteboard to design the solution, there are pieces of evaluation that you can initiate very, very early. So the common themes are summarized here, and I thought what I'd do is just spend one second or more on my own tools that I use, just from the clinician standpoint. So I do use the EMR, and for many of us who use EMR, it's painful. Uh, I, don't, I think we could use a lot more design in it just for the user interface. Um, but in addition, one of the things that doesn't, most EMRs don't do well is help us collaborate. We, we look at the EMR, most clinicians, as a giant repository, just like Home Depot. So it's a repository. It's only dynamic in the sense that it gets updated chronologically, but it's really a static repository. And so we've developed our own technology, which is a collaborative platform, a virtual tumor board, multidisciplinary team management tool at UCF that we're using. And all everybody has many tools that they use, and you're gonna hear about quite a few of them. We ask each person to tell us what their wish list is. Mine would be interoperability and more co-development, more multidisciplinary approach to finding solutions. And in monitoring uh, what tools we should be using, we need to refresh daily. I won't go through all these categories, but in the end, we should continue to challenge ourselves to say what needs to be fixed, what would be the best solution, and can we confirm that by using that evaluation piece. So on my panel, the first person I'd like to introduce today is Marion Bronstein. She's the Vice President of Product Management from Hippocrates.
Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with Hippocrates, I just want to give you a little quick background on it. Um, Hippocrates was a company that was founded in the late 1990s, really to bring mobile solutions to physicians and the challenges that physicians face every day. And that was a time when um, mobile solutions was really still very much in its infancy. Today, Hippocrates has a plethora of clinical reference and decision support tools that we provide for physicians. Um, one out of two US physicians use Hippocrates daily, and we have over a million clinical users worldwide. Um, and I think when I describe for you three common characteristics among physicians and clinicians, and hopefully illustrate that as part of today, will give you a better sense on why so many physicians use our applications. And the first is mobility. Physicians, by their nature, Physicians, by their nature, are very mobile professionals. I think all of us would like to think um, you know, that we're mobile professionals, but really, when you look at physicians, it's going from exam room to exam room, it's going from exam room to the nursing station, to their office, from their practice up to the hospital, on hospital rounds. They're very, very mobile um, professionals. The second characteristic that I want to identify is that they're critical thinkers. Physicians make life-enabling decisions for their patients, whether it be prescriptions, procedures, tests, diagnoses. They make life-enabling decisions for their patients every day, 365 days a year, multiple times a day. And that leads me to the third point, which these are also individuals that tend to be very, very pressured for time. So they're making these life-enabling decisions while they have a waiting room of patients backed up and they're trying to figure out how to move forward and get to the next one. So those three combined characteristics, mobility, critical thinking, uh, or criti critical decisions, and their pressure for time really created the recipe for Hippocrates. And I want to go ahead and highlight that for you really quickly um, right now. Uh, I'm going to show you this on an iPad. I will be let you know that most of our physicians actually use iPhones, um, but it's better for the display up here. And so basically, I'm going to pretend that I'm a physician. I'm seeing Ms. Jane Doe in the exam room. Um, uh, Ms. Doe has really struggled with her blood pressure. We've been trying to control it through diet and exercise. But based on the recent blood uh, pressure check and the upward trend of those values, I'm thinking it's time to move on to a blood pressure medication. I'm thinking Tenormin is probably the best medication um, in this situation. But I want to go ahead and just check um, the, do the dosing for hypertension and also see whether or not there are any black box warnings for that. And that's it. That is one of the most common use cases of how physicians use Hippocrates on a daily basis. And I think it goes back and identifying that it is mobile. Um, it is very much under that time, sen time sensitivity of getting in and out in really less than 15 seconds. And it's about making that critical decision. So I want to, um, that is how physicians use our product, but I actually, have many, many products, many, many feature sets. And so I'm going to go back in, and I'm just going to show you several of the challenges that Hippocrates, um, or several of the solutions that Hippocrates brings to the challenges that physicians face. So I'm going to go back into that same example that we use with Tenorman. And um, one of the things that I want to identify here is that um, physicians are constantly needing to take into consideration the healthcare costs. Um, I think we all are very, very aware of of the pain of um, the cost in the healthcare industry. So here, right here, they can see that Tenorman is actually um, a, at a high copay for the patient. Uh, we easily present the generic information, Atenolol, and I can quickly select and go to Atenolol to switch into um, a lower cost opportunity for my patient. I can see the um, dosing information by condition, hypertension, renal dosing, for instance. Um, I also can look at pediatric dosing. Uh, pediatric dosing is particularly relevant where I need to take into consideration uh, the weight of a patient. And right here, we include a pediatric dosing calculator for that patient. Look at black box warning. Uh, in this case, if that patient were to stop taking the medication abruptly, um, that could lead, lead to heart attack. So we want to be careful on that. Contraindications, adverse reactions. All of this information is designed to be very, very concise 
and provide the right information that the physician needs. Um, I can go ahead and look at drug interactions and see that um, if this patient, as in the previous speaker that we had, uh, had been diabetic, that there might be an uh, interaction with insulin. So I'm going to go ahead and show you something a little bit more in depth around our interaction checker, which is it actually can go in and identify very prescriptive actions that physicians should take. So in this case, the combination of atenolol and insulin um, really should be avoided or an alternative should be considered, and that's because the mechanism for the interaction is also displayed here, indicating that uh, it could mask the patient's ability to determine that their blood sugars are dropping and being lowered. I want to go ahead also and highlight for you one of our other um, applications that we have. So similar to our drug information, we also provide disease information. So if I had a patient who had come in uh, to the exam room complaining of a red eye with discharge and uh, itchiness, I would be able to go into what we call our disease monographs and basically look up some of those symptoms, get a visual perspective of images for that patient, urgent considerations, is this potentially related to a chemical injury, as well as looking at some of the differential diagnoses. And so, you know, my impression here that this actually may be related to uh, allergies is confirmed, and I can go ahead and take a look at some of the more specific things here, including exam information. If it had been a complicated case, I could actually look at what tests I maybe should, uh, should be ordering for that patient, as well as the treatment uh, options specifically here. So looking and saying, hmm, we should probably be prescribing uh, Tomalin for this patient. I want to take you just real quick and show you one other um, particularly useful application that we find uh, our physicians using. It's not uncommon at all for um, a, a patient to come into a physician's office and say, here, doc, here's my pill box, right? And assuming that a physician is going to recognize what those pills are. But that's not always the case. Um, and in fact, oftentimes that's a huge frustration for physicians in front of their patients. But uh, using our pill identification, they can actually go in and identify what the pills um, are that the patient's on. And in this case, the example that I'm using um, is amitriptyline. This actually is a true real use case. Um, while I gave you the example of a physician with a patient, this was a case where we had an EMT indicate that they had gone to a scene of an unresponsive 16-year-old. And in the middle of transport of that patient, uh, the parents were completely distraught and handed the EMT a, um, a set of pills that they had found next to the patient or next to the, their son. And the um, paramedic used the pill ID, pulled it up, found out that it was an antidepressant, looked it up, found out that there was a black box warning of potential suicide associated with that. And then based on that, looked in our uh, disease monographs, found out what the appropriate treatment is for response to overdose for these, and, and based on that, went ahead and administered sodium bicarbonate. So um, I actually want to share with you uh, the feedback that we received from the CMT. It said, um, this person submitted, it said, without pill ID, there would have been a significant delay in identifying the pills and administering treatment, which I feel would have led to this young person's life ending. So this is another example of a clinician, not a physician, but a paramedic, who was facing those same characteristics. Um, they were definitely in a mobile situation, right? They were right in the middle of a transport for this patient. Um, they were making a critical decision. I think that part is pretty obvious and clear. And they were under a tremendous pressure for not time, uh, not because they had another patient waiting in the exam room, but because it was truly a life and death scenario. So if I ask that you remember one thing um, through this portion of, um, uh, uh, of my demo is that you remember that 15 second scenario, that in and out, um, because I think that really comes back to looking at what physicians and other clinicians need to help them get through their day when they are in fact such mobile professionals, when in fact they are making these critical decisions under tremendous time pressure. Thank you for your time.
Our next speaker is Donna Cryer, who's CEO of Cryer Health and ePatient. Last night we were talking about uh, the various countries that we came from, and so I hail from the strange foreign land of Washington, D.C. Um, and most, uh, if, if you've sort of seen me before or, or met me, uh, you know that I sit on a host of uh, government committees as a patient representative, whether that's for FDA or ONC or NIH and a, a variety of things. I, I go to those meetings and sit through those so you don't have to, so you're very welcome. Um, but today, I'd, I'd really uh, like to talk to you as a patient uh, rather than a patient representative and give you perhaps an idealized version of my life as a patient and the struggles that I go through in trying to manage my care and stay healthy enough to travel all over and get to talk to you um, and to be able to wear my seersucker suit with Keds, which is something we don't get to do in DC. Um, so, there we go. So most of the time, many times when we're talking about digital health and innovation, we start with um, a really cool technology. And I'd like us to anchor uh, our thoughts in my challenges as a patient. And I think if, we, if you all can help me solve some of my lifestyle challenges posed by the various conditions I have, that will come out with products that really do resonate, that do scale, that do make a difference in, in the marketplace as well as in, in patients' lives. So a few of the, of the things, and frankly, I had to edit it down for time, but um, in your interest. Uh, so I was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease uh, 30 years ago. So I'm on a biologic now. I have an injection every other week. Um, I have a full-time job, I think, basically trying to drink fluids. Um, but it's not just water. I have to have, since I have no colon any longer, um, it's, it's Gatorade. It's you know talking, negotiating with TSA to allow me to take my insure clear. Uh, through with me on the plane. Um, small meals, low fiber, lots of different things, liquid iron and vitamins, powder fiber. So as we think about adherence, um, when we think of medications, I only have two prescriptions right now, but it's adherence to an entire lifestyle of, of things and activities that will really uh, get me through. I also happen to have uh, a liver transplant. And uh, instead of the 17 different uh, medications that I was handed in sort of a fishing tackle box, um, 18 years ago uh, when I was transplanted, I only have one immunosuppressant at this, at this time. I also, also thanks to um, both uh, the joys of prednisone, sort of corticosteroids, and a, a career as a, as, a, as a dancer and soccer player or football for those from, from uh, outside the United States. Um, I have both osteoarthritis and osteoporosis, and so we're trying to figure out sort of low impact things that I can do to stay well and some additional things to take. I have multiple specialists, as you can imagine, blood work, imaging, procedures that I'm trying to fit into a very busy lifestyle, frequently out of the office, as I am now. Um, and then there's this thing called family. My husband likes me, thankfully, likes to see me. Um, I have two little Yorkie puppies uh, who my, my youngest daughter referred to as her sisters, so I love that, and friends I'd like to see. And so. How can you, as digital in, in, uh, innovators, help me solve uh, these challenges? So as I think through um, what makes a patient really use digital tools, not just to download them and never use them again or use them just for a day, um, it's really the relevance. And so for someone with me in chronic disease, there are a lot of different tools in the overall health and wellness space that really just aren't relevant to me. So there are thousands of apps that I'll, I'll never actually use. Convenience, um, how easy is it for me to use it? Is the, I think the, the real key is how much information can be just uploaded passively. What's the least amount of work that I need to do to be able to use the app is what I look for. And then connectivity, um, and that's to my doctors um, and their systems, which there's a big gap in being able to do that, but it's also with other patients and other, and other systems as well. So those are the three factors that I think about um, and that I'll discuss as I go through today. So I've done this sort of a glimpse of my idealized morning, noon, and night. And I'll just touch up about a few of these and, uh, and some of the digital opportunities that still exist. So 
every morning, the first thing I do is step on uh, my Wybing's digital scale that uploads and graphs. But I don't use it for my weight. I don't really care about my weight for the most part. Um, I don't use it for uh, the body fat um, directly because um, I'm not really so concerned about that. What I use it for, um, I use the body fat percentage as a proxy for how hydrated I am because that's the thing that will most likely uh, lead me to be in the hospital, that I haven't been able to absorb fluids as, as well as I can, and so I'm dehydrated. And so I've used the, the scale as a proxy for that. Um, some of the apps that I use, GI Monitor and a prescription reminder, the thing I, I want you to take away with is that I use them eight to 10 times a day, and the Arch Reminder 14 times during the day. So it's not just one hour or, or this. This is something that I'm thinking about minute to minute to be able to manage myself. Somewhere in there I get a little work done, hopefully. Um, and then one of the things that would help me most, really, is to be able to better coordinate all the calls that I'm making to my doctor's office to, to schedule them um, a little more coherently and easily. So my afternoon goal is to balance work and health actions. And that might be also going to doctor's appointments, reviewing my lab results. I'm frequently surprised by how often I have the lab, lab results before my doctor's office seem to. And if I get one more call with them you know, saying, you're fine, instead of giving me my lab results and going through them actively, um, it's really quite amazing. One thing I'd like to point out on this slide is how many patients uh, are very interested in searching for for clinical trials and the growing um, platforms for clinical trial solutions and matching that are patient driven, whether it's genetic alliances, registries for all, or patients like me and other things. And so I think that there's a real opportunity there. And finally at night, the goal is to both connect and disconnect. Um, having uh, had my conditions for, for decades now, I want to be able to mentor other patients. And so doing that through peer-to-peer -peer, uh, new web technologies that came out of some recent incubators, participating in leading tweet chats, um, looking on, on Facebook, being able to give back and connect to other patients in social communities is an important part of many patients' lives. And then finally, trying to get to sleep. So whether that is listening to a white noise or doing a heart math um, coherence technology, um, that is, uh, how I try to end, end the day and disconnect from all of this uh, patient activity. And we can go over my wish list perhaps in uh, conversations afterwards, and then that is how to connect with me. Thank you. Great job, Donna, thank you. Our next speaker is Bob Thor, the VP of Innovation and Research and Development for the United Health Group. Hi, as you mentioned, I'm a VP of Innovation and R&D with United Health Group. Um, someone asked me before, does that mean you're in charge of all innovation at United Health Group? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I wish that were true, but no. But I get, I, my, my goal and what I get to do is I'm from the technology side. I get to look at the technologies, get the opportunity to meet with folks like the folks around this room and try to figure out how do we take those technologies and bring those into healthcare. Um, when I was prepping for this, they said, can you pick some of the, you know, a product or something you've got out there and come up and talk about it. And I kind of struggled a bit with that, mostly because we don't really have one product and we're not just looking at one area. So I thought I'd take you through kind of a few areas that we're looking at. One from the consumer, what are we trying to do to help the consumer connect in healthcare? Number two, from a provider perspective. And then three, how do we connect the provider and then the consumer together? And by the way, that picture was not me standing on the wall there. So helping the con connecting the consumers, and what do we have out there? Uh, we've got lots of things, and our, really our goal here is to try to get consumers engaged in their health. Try to get them to really come in and be part of the health system, being knowledgeable of what they have, give them the tools so they can effectively manage that. Some of the things that we're looking at and doing and some things that we actually have done in market, you may have seen we've done a, an announcement at CES with uh, Dance Dance Revolution. And this was a goal of ours to try to get out there and get kids in the school districts and get kids moving where they traditionally can't be moving out there. So we partnered with Konami, took their solution, put a curriculum around this, and now offer this in schools to get kids using games, what was traditionally a game, and get them moving in a big, large group setting. 
very, very effective and very, very interesting to watch the interactions and what people would perceive as having fun, they are now in doing something very healthy. Optimize Me is a platform that we developed, which is a social challenges and health application um, that we offer out to our members as part of United Health Group, as well as we, um, it's available for anybody in the App Store. But what it enables people to do is participate in a series of challenges and do that in a social way. So basically you can you know, opt in with a group of your individuals, your employers can put out challenges out there for you, and then be able to go out there and track your progress against it. We talked about the widening scales, we've talked about polar. Being able to bring that information in and participate in a challenge that gets and get people actively moving and managing things like you know, who can drink the most cups of water in a day or you know, the appropriate amount of water in a day or who can walk the uh, length of the Empire State Building. Uh, we're looking at other areas out there. We've got things like you know, virtual trainers. What can we do around virtual training to get consumers moving, get them active, and do that in a place where they can actually do it where they're comfortable. They don't have to get up and make the effort to go to a gym if they don't want to, but they can participate in this and get the best in class uh, folks being able to help them through their, um, their fitness challenges. Uh, things like portable gyms or scavenger hunts, and this, which is very interesting. One of our, or many of our employers who are asking us to help them out are saying, help my population become more knowledgeable about healthcare. Um, the literacy rate is fairly low, so how, how do we get them to understand what their benefits are? What do they need to do to understand when they should go to a doctor? When should they go see a, you know, a therapist? And so we've created something called Scavenger Hunt, which is starting to help our employee population learn about their benefits, learn how to use their benefits, how to effectively use the healthcare system. And this is just a smattering of things that we've got going in the consumer space, but gives you kind of a taste of things that we have happening. From a consumer and a provider. So how do, how do we bring the consumer and the provider together? You know, so you've got all this apps, you've got all this data out there, you've got the providers out there, and you've got them trying to do things. We're looking at how do we take some of these technologies to try and uh, bridge that gap between the consumer, knowing what to communicate to them, how to get information to them. Our Help For Me application is something we've developed, it's a mobile application that really puts the person's health plan in their, in, their, in their hand, as well as their personal health information, and allows that individual to be able to go in and have an effective conversation with their doctor now. It partners with something I'll show you a little bit later, which is called our Provisor app, which allows them to be able to communicate um, that information directly to the physician. Now the physician can combine that with their information and they can share information and have an effective conversation. Um, our personal devices hub. This is something that we've been working on for a while because we recognize that there's lots of devices, there's lots of places where information, um, you know, Anand talk, talked about the WellDoc application. Lots of information that if we can get that to come in and let consumers pick the devices or let doctors give the right devices to the consumer, and allow that information to be communicated in without having to think too much about it, have that information combined in their personal health record, and then allow that information to be communicated to the doctor in a seamless way will really transform how you know, consumers uh, engage and how doctors engage consumers in healthcare. We're looking at things like, you know, how do we take some new technologies, uh, specifically things that might not be for this, we talked about the Dance Dance Revolution. Could we take the Connect devices, and we've seen lots of folks out there doing this, and we're starting to partner with a few of them as well as come up with our own things. How do we take a Connect device, turn that into a physical therapy or occupational therapy type application, or how do we turn it into something that we can use for cognitive therapy to help people participate in therapies in their home, capture information about what they're doing, take that information, communicate it back to the doctor, and allow the doctor then to adjust in real time the therapies that that person might be participating in. Specifically in those two areas, there's a huge gap right now because of, you know, people will go in, they get their prescription around the therapies they're supposed to be doing, they turn around, they go home, and of course they all do it. The doctor has no idea if they did it, but when they talk to the doctor, they, you know, they tell them, yes, I went in, did all my exercises, did them all correctly every single time. These type of technologies and things that we're looking at in this space will help capture that, educate them, and uh, communicate that information back to their, uh, their uh, therapist or their doctors so that they can effectively um, adjust and uh, monitor that person's progress. So let me talk a little bit about what's going on with our providers right now. You saw some of the stuff around Hippocrates, and we're trying to take a lot of those same type of technologies. Our Provisor application, uh, which is down at the bottom here, which is missing its label, um, is a tool that we now provide to our doctors that allows them to effectively go in and look at that person, look at their plan, look at the clinical information that we have about them or their past claims information, 
their personal health information and put that into the hands of the doctor so that they have all the information right there at that time. Um, we talked about the device hub, bringing that device information in, monitors for them, being able to look at you know, what they're tying into the EMR and look at all the clinical information we have about that and communicate that in a nice, easy fashion for the doctor. Our Optum PATH, which PATH stands for Patient Assessment Form, by the way, um, is another tool where we go through and we look at the, all the clinical information we have about our, patient, or our members and provide that back to the doctor. Look for gaps in care. Look for areas that a person might be missing on some checkups. Um, communicate to them where they may have gone to other places that their patient is not effectively communicating to them. So uh, we had an example of a patient who had a heart attack while they were vacationing in Florida. When they got back to Minnesota, they didn't, they didn't want to tell their doctor about it. I had a heart attack. We were able to identify this, provide that to the primary care physician, and show them that, you know, yes, here's the complete picture that we know about them. Now combine that with their EMR information. Uh, we have things like LifeLens, which is a new tool that we're putting out to enable people to, or doctors and clinicians and field workers, to be able to go out and uh, securely um, take pictures or videos or record the events they're having with people in remote rural areas. So as part of the care, you know, the, the plan coordinator, they're able to coordinate that information back and bring that information back so others can review some of that. So these are just a few of the technologies and some of the things that they took you through from a consumer perspective, the provider, and then kind of bringing those two together and then figuring out how do we do it. So as I look across around the room here, a lot of the things I've talked about were not just United, was not just United Healthcare. It was us partnering with other people out there. And you know, as you think about things, if you think about technologies, we'd love to connect and find out how we can take some things that you might be thinking about and combine them with some of the thinking that we have going. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Our next speaker is David Inns, who's the CEO of Great Call. We're trying to stay right on time so we have time for your questions at the end. Thank you. So I'll go really fast then. <laughs> so um, Great Call, what we believe is that for digital health to be successful, we're gonna have to get the aging consumer to engage and actually adopt these technologies. And that's gonna be a challenge. If you can go to the, the first slide, please. Or actually, I guess I should just pick this up. There we go. Wow, is this it? Yes. Green arrow, okay. It's more complicated than I would have imagined this looking. Um, so aging consumers, when they wake up in the morning, they have a lot of worries that they're thinking about, right? We have uh, a lot of loneliness, not being engaged with family members enough, living alone, uh, not challenged mentally. Um, we have questions about health, can't remember what the doctor said at the last appointment, it's driving them crazy. Do I call the doctor again? I called them three times yesterday. I probably shouldn't ask them, they forget. Uh, worried about leaving the house. This is a big thing we find. They're worried, okay, if I have a fall in the house, that's one thing. If I leave the house and something happens to me when I've left the house, that's a big problem if there's nobody with me. What am I gonna do about these uh, situations? And then of course, complicated medication regimens and a lot of different problems. So what we do at Great Call is uh, we have a portfolio of uh, services targeted to try to alleviate these problems. So between our Jitterbug, where I'll show you how we've really evolved that into an mHealth platform, to Five Star Urgent Response, which is uh, one of the first mobile personal emergency response products, uh, to our portfolio of um, health and medical apps for aging Americans, that we really uh, take things like loneliness, keep them connected, give them the ways to manage their medications. Uh, we um, uh, we give them brain games through some of our partners like Posit Science and access to nurses and doctors to take away and help them very quickly get answers to their questions about health. And we give them mobile personal emergency response so they feel free to go wherever they want to go and alleviate their worries and are left with a uh, more happy place every day. So we're about empowering aging consumers to live active, independent lives. What I'm gonna do today is focus on one of our products, which is Jitterbug. We have uh, two versions, our Jitterbug Plus and our Jitterbug Touch uh, touchscreen product, which is fairly new. And walk through uh, a, a slight demonstration on how this is a, uh, evolved into an mHealth platform and how the aging consumer can use it. Because again, it's all about getting adoption. They can't download 10 apps. They don't wanna download 10 apps and use different things and different devices. So the key to this platform is one device, it's shipped to you, it works, no sensors, no installation, no Wi-Fi required. It just comes out of the box and it works. And um, it's mobile, uh, it's simple, it's easy to see, hear, and hold, 
and it comes with service backed by real live people, which is really important for engaging uh, aging consumers as well. They've gotta be able to speak to real people. So let's just go through a couple of things. Oops, I just hit the laser, there we go. Let's go through a couple of things. So I'm an aging consumer, I wake up in the morning, and of course, uh, so I have CHF, uh, actually just like my mother, and I have several medications. I have a fairly complicated uh, medication schedule to, uh, to keep track of. If I'm on the Jitterbug Plus, I'm sitting down just before breakfast maybe, I get my, uh, my phone rings and I have a, um, a, a communication with, a, with an IVR that is giving in a nice friendly voice my morning medications and I'm responding to whether I've taken them or not and, uh, and of course that's all tracked and available later. On the Jitterbug Touch, it's another simple way uh, where the medication schedule is put up on the Jitterbug Touch, you simply answer the questions whether you've taken them or not, and that information is stored. So I take my morning medications, I feel pretty good, it was, wasn't that stressful, remember to take everything on time and on schedule. Uh, so then I decide I'm gonna take the dog for a walk, because I'm mobile. And uh, like most aging Americans today, uh, a lot of them are mobile. So we're saying, I'm, can, I'm gonna take the dog out for a walk. But unfortunately, I walk down the hall, and as I go to pick up the dog leash, I smash my head on the hallway table. I don't know, as my father was aging, I always picture he always had uh, a lump or a, a cut on his head. It was amazing how often he would hit his head as he got over 80, and I just, uh, it's, uh, this is one of those things where, so I smash my head on the table, I'm not feeling very good, uh, I'm wondering whether I should go to the doctor, maybe the emergency room, because that's my favorite place to go when something goes wrong is the emergency room. But um, instead, I remember that I've got urgent care uh, on, my, on my jitterbug device. So uh, on my touch uh, device that comes with basically urgent care has uh, medication, uh, sorry, uh, symptom lookup uh, capability. So I start looking up head injury. I'm looking in the mirror. I see my pupils are okay. Uh, you know, maybe I'm gonna be all right. So I hit a button though and talk to uh, a live nurse um, both in both applications. I call the live nurse. Uh, that is the first stage of urgent care, our, our application. And uh, they asked me several questions, and together with the nurse, uh, which also, by the way, we can have a doctor call you back within half an hour if the nurse decides that's something that's necessary, uh, or if you're deciding that that's something that's necessary. But uh, in this case, the nurse asked several questions, decides there's no nausea, no dizziness, that I'm gonna be okay, um, and that uh, I should you know, keep an eye out for certain symptoms and then decide uh, potentially another time just uh, to, to see a doctor if necessary. So uh, just quickly touching on some of the statistics we've seen using our urgent care application of about the 41% of the people that were gonna go to the emergency room with the uh, issue that they called in about, uh, we had 24% of those redirected to their physician to non-urgent uh, care and about 18% to home care. So through this product having a real impact. So anyway, my head feels better. The bleeding stopped, my eyes are good, I'm, not, I'm feeling up to it, so I grab the leash and I take the dog out for a walk. But as I'm you know, walking through the neighborhood, I start to feel a little you know, off again, my heart starts racing, maybe I'm a little dizzy, short of breath, I'm not sure what's going on and I'm a little worried because I'm now away from the home and the only person to help me is my dog. So um, on that, on the, on the left-hand side, you see on Jitterbug Plus, you simply dial five-star on the phone and you get an NAAD certified agent who was able to ask you questions, triage the situation, uh, conference in family members, uh, dispatch if necessary. Um, and on the Android version, uh, on the lock screen, there's a five-star button right there so that it can connect uh, right into uh, the NAAD certified agents that we have. So they can see where you are, obviously, on a map, so they know you're out about from your house and exactly where you are um, and outside. And they start asking some questions. They're going through uh, their protocols, and they decide um, as they're going through, you start deciding that, you know what? You're feeling better. You're getting your breath back. It looks like it's passed. Maybe it was just stress from hitting your head. You're feeling okay. They're a little nervous. They uh, communicate with your daughter, conference her in and uh, that uh, you convince them you do not want to dispatch because you're feeling 100% better at this point in time. And uh, so the, doc, uh, the daughter agrees to go check on her when she gets home. Um, and basically, so you get off the phone, you walk your dog back home, daughter comes in, checks on you, everything's great. By the way, the daughter can also track you on the map if necessary, if you're uh, more of an Alzheimer's situation or somewhere where early onset Alzheimer's. And uh, now you're home feeling good, uh, you decide to relax in the backyard, 
And the last piece of what's important about this tool is engagement. Um, because, you know, so we have several ways that we feel this product, not only is it delivering all those services, but it also provides that engagement with the, uh, with the aging consumer. So we have, uh, again, as I mentioned, Posit Science, who we've worked with to customize brain games for the Jitterbug platform um, that, help, uh, that have been proven to improve mental acuity. We have a uh, wellness doctor, Dr. Brian Allman, delivering uh, calls to reduce depression and to, uh, to reduce depression and to, um, and to improve sleep and, uh, and to lower stress. And then, of course, we, you're getting text messages from your grandchildren. You're getting pictures on your jitterbug uh, on either of your phones. You're getting pictures from your grandchildren and staying connected uh, and safe and healthy. And that is what our goal is, is for at the end of the day, the daughter can quickly call her mother and make sure she's good and have access to all that data and make sure she's safe and healthy at home. So that's what we do, a little bit of a demonstration of the Jitterbug M Health platform. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd just like to open this up to Q&A from the audience. Uh, we're right on time. We have about seven minutes left. Um, I have questions, of course, a ton of questions for my esteemed colleagues, but I'd love to hear from the audience what your questions are. Would anybody like to start? Sure. I see a hand in the back corner here. First, I'd also like to thank the panelists. I learned a lot, and I'm very excited because, as I said, we have to refresh every day. There's so many wonderful technologies that are evolving. Uh, thank you. Thank you for um, the presentation. My name is John Kuhn. I'm, the, uh, I'm with the magazine called Medical Electronic Device Solutions. I really appreciate uh, the presentation from uh, Donna. So Donna's presentation actually sounded like uh, a trained clinician more than a patient. <laughs> so uh, as a potential patient, right? Mm -hmm. So I would like to know when you say mentoring other mm -hmm. patients. So for example, I have a technical background. Sometimes when I try to learn how to use this uh, Android phone, it drives me crazy. So, so as a patient, and the devices that you mentioned, those are wonderful things. So what kind of ideas do you have when you say helping other patients, maybe how to learn these uh, devices or how to use what you just described there? Is that a club? Is that an online thing? So what ideas do you have? Sure. Thank you so much for that question. I think that, you know, we had high hopes for Haptique and Health Tap seems to be both uh, sort of more driven by physician reviews. And I think there's very much a need for uh, a patient curation of apps. So I do get a lot of calls um, and have, um, you know, sort of road tested an uh, even larger version that I've, that I've used there. And I sort of presented to you things that, that stick. And so I think that in, um, D various disease online forums, in Inspire communities, in Smart Patients, certainly. Uh, the new venture that Ronnie Zeger, formerly from Google, um, and Giles Friedman, who is run one of the um, largest oncology communities, that's part of what they're seeing in patients mentoring other patients. But that is um, very much a need for being able to, to guide patients through you know, what apps and different types of technologies be most helpful dependent on their on their situation um, and uh, I you know it, it needs to be scaled so more than just me um, and and one-to-one -one. the other type of mentoring that that I do that there's a, a need for um, is as there are increasing opportunities for patients to participate on whether it's in patient-centered medical homes or on government committees to mentor other patients in the skills, um, either on technology or research um, or other types of skills to be able to participate meaningful, meaningfully in those types of um, environments. So that's other stuff that I mentor patients on. Great. Any other questions from the audience? See one up front here. There's a microphone coming. Um, Thank you very much uh, to everybody for taking the time to come here. My name is Pedro Amshad. I'm a practicing physician, both hospitalist and uh, outpatient. I really enjoyed your presentations. Two questions come to my mind as a practicing physician is uh, the legal aspects of things in terms of uh, being accused of practic practicing medicine without a license 
And uh, the second thing is cost. Um, what are the costs of the, these devices to patients? Thank you. Did you want to direct your question to yeah. someone in particular? The second one, perhaps, uh, for Great Call and uh, sure. anyone else who's involved in the uh, consumer-based uh, device uh, market. Maybe as a lawyer on the panel, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I think it's, it's interesting as sort of patient-driven exchanges, um, you know, as a patient, I am not a HIPAA-covered entity, so I can share uh, information. And I think that, um, though you rightly point out a fine line between uh, supporting patients and mentoring and giving them advice um, and, you know, sort of operating above li my licensure, which is what I say uh, to my physician um, husband, and giving medical advice. I think patients give strategies um, and ways to consider the options, but then uh, the final decisions need to be made with, with clinicians um, of various sorts. And I'm sorry, your second, the second part of your question was? The cost of the device. The cost. Most of the apps and things I use are free. Um, of course, the, you know, the scale had some cost. One of the things that I find interesting is that when you compare the cost of um, devices or various technologies and a host of different things, it pales in comparison to what one day in the hospital for a complex patient would be. So I think um, in terms of your first question for us, all of our nurses and doctors that we use are licensed in the uh, state in which the call was based. So they, it is absolutely all the doctors and nurses that are involved are licensed. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we always believe as kind of a bigger company out there that our apps, we do everything we can for security, privacy, all SAS 70 infrastructure. And we have, uh, you know, gone overboard with making sure HIPAA compliance and everything to make sure that we are a, a poster child, what somebody would expect uh, an app to be for, uh, especially if we're dealing with uh, older consumers. Um, in terms of the cost, so, um, you know, the Jitterbug platform, so you get a Jitterbug, the, the device itself is $99, and then the monthly fee that would include, so we have now freedom uh, packages, which include access to nurses and doctors and uh, personal emergency response and come with some <laughs> amount of minutes and, uh, and photo exchanges for uh, $24.99. So it's become very cost effective. I think that's one of the things that I look at and say, you know, with a lot of these tools that can impact the healthcare system, it's no longer $100 million R&D budgets that are causing us to then have to charge hundreds of dollars a month to, to deliver these benefits to consumers. I can go out and sell competitively in the market uh, directly to consumers at a price that they're willing to pay for tools that are going to actually help impact the healthcare system significantly. I think your question has brought up some really interesting tensions that exist because the earth is moving beneath our feet in this and we don't have societal or legal consensus around a lot of issues including free the data versus six reminders a week that we can be fined $250,000 for a HIPAA breach. But we need to all be at the table to start working through the alignment of those tensions and I think it's really important. So it's just one example of that. Thank you for that question. Are there other questions from the audience? We have 12 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I really thank my panelists. I learned a lot, and I'm very inspired by them. Thank you. Thanks very much.